Welcome back to the Bang Channel. Today we will explore the Bang's summarized exploration of the skin color of the indigenous tribes of North America as told by the eyewitness, writer, and historian James Adair. Step into the world of James Adair, a remarkable figure who lived from 1709 to 1783. This video aims to unravel the essence of James Adair's eyewitness accounts, offering a deeper understanding of the intricate tapestry he wove through his experiences. Join us on this journey as we uncover the layers of meaning and significance behind Adair's observations, a portal to a world where history and culture intertwine. The Indians are of a copper or red clay color, and they delight in everything which they imagine may promote and increase it. Accordingly, they paint their faces with vermilion as the best and most beautiful ingredient. The indigenous people's custom of painting their faces with vermilion is highlighted. Vermilion is described as the best and most beautiful ingredient used for this purpose. Vermilion is a bright red pigment that has been historically used in various cultures for painting, coloring, and decoration. It is made from a specific mineral called cinnabar, which is a form of mercury sulfide. Vermilion has been highly valued for its intense red color and its ability to withstand fading over time. It should be noted that the indigenous people did not only paint their faces, but rather their whole body was covered with vermilion. Much like the Hemba people, who are located in Central Africa, within the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is situated between Uganda and Tanzania on the east coast, and Angola, Gabon, and Cameroon on the west coast of Africa. The Hemba people paint their bodies with red clay. If we consider the common laws of nature and providence, we shall not be surprised at this custom, for everything loves best its own likeness and place in the creation and is disposed to ridicule its opposite. This part sets up the premise that the statement is going to discuss something in the context of general principles that govern the natural world and the ways in which things unfold under the guidance of a higher power or providence. This part suggests that when we apply these principles to a particular custom or behavior, we shouldn't find it unexpected or astonishing. Here, the idea is that everything tends to have an affinity for what resembles itself and for its specific role or position in the grand scheme of creation. In other words, beings and entities prefer what is familiar and similar to themselves. This part explains that entities also have a tendency to mock or belittle what is different or contrary to their own nature or characteristics. It implies that differences can be met with ridicule or contempt. Putting it all together, this sentence is suggesting that based on the general patterns observed in nature, it's not surprising that people or entities tend to favor what is similar to them and tend to criticize or make fun of what is different. This concept is being applied to a specific custom that was mentioned earlier in the passage, likely referring to the practice of the indigenous people painting their faces with vermilion. If, if a deformed son of burning Africa was to paint the devil, he would not do it in black colors, nor delineate him with a shagged, coarse woolly head, nor with thick lips, a short flat nose, or clumsy feet, like those of a bear. His devil would represent one of a different nation or people. But was he to draw an agreeable picture according to the African taste, he would daub it all over with sooty black. If a deformed son of burning Africa was to paint the devil, this part sets up a hypothetical scenario involving an individual described as a deformed son of burning Africa. The imagery here likely refers to a person from Africa, and the term deformed might imply someone with physical differences from the norm. This person is imagined to be painting an image of the devil. He would not do it in black colors, nor delineate him with a shaggy coarse woolly head, nor with thick lips, a short flat nose, or clumsy feet, like those of a bear, 
This part outlines what this hypothetical artist would not include in their depiction of the devil. It lists various characteristics that are commonly associated with the physical features of African people as depicted through stereotypes, black colors, coarse woolly head, thick lips, a short flat nose, and clumsy feet. These stereotypes were historically used to caricature and demean African people. His devil would represent one of a different nation or people. Here, it is suggested that this hypothetical artist from Africa would instead portray the devil as belonging to a different group or nation. The implication is that the artist would avoid portraying the devil with the same physical attributes that might be used to stereotype and mock their own people. In essence, this sentence uses a hypothetical scenario to criticize the use of stereotypes. It suggests that even in portraying something negative, like the devil, people might still carry biases and preferences for their own group, avoiding using derogatory attributes associated with their own culture while applying them to others. But was he to draw an agreeable picture, according to the African taste, he would daub it all over with sooty black. This sentence can be broken down as follows. But was he to draw an agreeable picture? This part introduces a contrasting situation to the previous hypothetical scenario. It suggests that, if the same artist from Africa were to create a depiction that is considered pleasant or appealing, something different would happen. According to the African taste, here, it specifies that the artist's creation would align with the preferences and sensibilities of African culture or people. He would daub it all over with sooty black. In this part, it's implied that, if the artist were to make an agreeable or aesthetically pleasing depiction, they would use sooty black as a color. This color choice, sooty black, is presented as something that would be favored and used according to African preferences. In summary, this sentence presents a contrasting scenario where the artist from Africa, when creating an agreeable or attractive depiction, would use a color, sooty black, that aligns with African preferences, potentially challenging the negative connotations associated with those characteristics earlier mentioned in the passage. It underscores the idea that artistic choices can be influenced by cultural tastes and sensibilities. All the Indians are so strongly attached to and prejudiced in favor of their own color that they think as meanly of the whites as we possibly can do of them. All the Indians are so strongly attached to and prejudiced in favor of their own color. This part asserts that indigenous people referred to as the Indians have a strong emotional connection and bias towards their own skin color. This attachment and prejudice are rooted in their identity and self-perception. That they think as meanly of the whites as we possibly can do of them, this part explains the result of their strong attachment to their own color. It suggests that, because of this attachment, indigenous people hold negative views or think as meanly of white people, similar to how Adair and presumably others might hold negative views of indigenous people. The phrase, as we possibly can do of them, implies a comparison between the negative perceptions held by both groups. In essence, this sentence highlights the existence of biases and negative perceptions on both sides, where indigenous people hold negative views of white people due to their strong attachment to their own color, paralleling the negative views that others might hold towards indigenous people. The English traders among them experience much of it and are often very glad to be allowed to pass muster with the Indian chieftains, as fellow brethren of the human species. This sentence can be broken down as follows. The English traders among them experience much of it. This part introduces the English traders who interact with the indigenous people. It suggests that these English traders encounter the negative biases and perceptions mentioned earlier in the passage and are often very glad to be allowed to pass muster with the Indian chieftains, this part explains the reaction of the English traders. It states that the traders are pleased and relieved when they are accepted and approved by the indigenous chieftains. The phrase, to pass muster, means to be accepted or approved after being evaluated. As fellow brethren of the human species, here, it describes the perception that the English traders want to project to the indigenous chieftains. The traders want to be seen as equals or fellow brethren in the human species, highlighting a desire for recognition and acceptance. In summary, this sentence illustrates how the English traders who interact with the indigenous people experience the biases and prejudices mentioned earlier. They feel relief and happiness when they are accepted by the indigenous chieftains as equals in the human species, indicating the importance of being recognized and respected within the cultural context. 
one instance will sufficiently show in what flattering glasses they view themselves. Some time passed, a large body of the English Indian traders, on their way to the Choctaw country, were escorted by a body of Creek and Choctaw warriors. The Creeks having a particular friendship for some of the traders, who had treated them pretty liberally, took this opportunity to chide the Choctaws, before the traders, in a smart though friendly way, for not allowing to the English, the name of human creatures, for the general name they give us in their most favorable war speeches, resembles that of a contemptible, heterogeneous animal. The hotter, or colder the climate is, where the Indians have long resided, the greater proportion have they either of the red, or white, color. I took particular notice of the Shoreno Indians, as they were passing from the northward, within 53 miles of the Chickasaw country, to that of the Creeks, and, by comparing them with the Indians which I accompanied to their camp, I observed the Shoreno to be much fairer, than the Chickasaw, though I am satisfied. Their endeavors to cultivate the copper color, were alike. Many incidents and observations lead me to believe, that the Indian color, is not natural, but that the external difference between them, and the whites, proceeds entirely from their customs, and method of living, and not from any inherent spring of nature, which will entirely overturn Lord Keynes's whole system of color, and separate races of men. Let's break down the passage. The passage opens by highlighting the significance of a single instance that can vividly showcase how the indigenous people perceive themselves. The instance of interaction, a while ago, a group of English Indian traders was en route to the Choctaw country. They were accompanied by Creek and Choctaw warriors, with the Creeks harboring a special affinity for certain traders who treated them generously. Friendly banter and observation, the Creeks used this situation to engage in light-hearted banter, albeit with a friendly undertone. In the presence of the traders, they playfully criticized the Choctaws for denying the English the title of human creatures. This was based on the derogatory term that the indigenous people used in their war speeches to refer to the English, portraying them as something contemptible and unlike themselves. Climate and skin color. The passage shifts to discussing the connection between climate and skin color. It notes that the longer indigenous tribes have resided in hotter or colder climates, the more likely they are to exhibit variations in skin color, either reddish or whitish. Observation of Shawano Indians, the author, presumably the James Adair, in cultivating provides a copper specific color. observation of the Shawano Indians' copper, copper color. color. He noticed them as they traveled southward from the northern region, passing near the Chikasa country on their way to the creeks. In a comparative analysis, he found that the Shawano Indians had a fairer complexion than the Chickasaw people. This intrigued him, mainly because both tribes seemed to share similar efforts in cultivating a copper color. Cultivating copper, copper color. color. Copper copper color. color. Questioning natural color, James Adair presents a thought-provoking assertion, based on various incidents and observations. He suggests that the difference in skin color between indigenous people and those of European descent is not a natural trait, but rather a result of their distinct customs and ways of life. He challenges the idea that skin color is inherently determined by nature, which would challenge Lord Keynes's theories about race and color, and potentially lead to a revision of the notion of separate races of humans. In essence, the passage delves into interactions between different indigenous tribes and their perceptions, climate's influence on skin color, and the author's observations on the relationship between customs and skin color. It introduces an intriguing perspective on the origins of skin color and raises questions about the prevailing theories of that time. Today, there are many theories concerning the origin of race and skin color, such as the environmental adaption theory, the ultraviolet and vitamin D synthesis theory, the sexual selection theory, and the genetic mutation theory, just to name a few. But when one does as James Adair did, and makes observations that are verifiable by the observations themselves, a clear picture or a pattern begins to appear. Such as the fact that white people have been in North America for over 400 years and have yet to systematically begin to achieve a darker skin tone filled with melanin. Do Alaskans have vitamin D deficiency? Because most of the vitamin D in the human body is typically synthesized endogenously by way of dermal exposure to ultraviolet light, living in far northern or southern latitudes is a known risk factor for vitamin D deficiency. However, the traditional Inuit diet in northern and southern latitudes consists mainly of fish and marine mammals rich in vitamin D. Melanin is the substance in the skin that makes it dark. 
It competes for UVB, ultraviolet B radiation, with the substance in the skin that kickstarts the body's vitamin D production. As a result, dark-skinned people tend to require more UVB exposure than light-skinned people to generate the same amount of vitamin D. James Adair had no knowledge of this during his time. With respect to his theory, today it would be the environmental adaptation theory. Neither James Adair nor Lord Kames could have predicted that their theories would still be a contention of study for the next 400 years. Now, let's get back to Mr. Adair. That the Indian color is merely accidental or artificial appears pretty evident. Their own traditions record them to have come to their present lands by the way of the West, from a far distant country, and where there was no variation of color in human beings, and they are entirely ignorant which was the first or primitive color. James Adair's perspective on the color of indigenous people suggests an intriguing possibility that their hue was either accidental or artificially influenced. Notably, he noticed the use of vermilion in body painting, which leads to the question, could the initial copper or red clay color he mentioned have been intentionally altered by applying vermilion to achieve a redder shade? This notion is rooted in the similarity between copper, red clay, and reddish brown, all sharing a common brown hue. However, Adair does hint at a distinction between these shades, particularly when he highlights that the Shawano tribe's skin appeared fairer than that of the Chickasaw. This suggests a range of skin tones among different tribes. Adair introduces a compelling concept, the cultivation of the copper color. The term cultivate implies efforts to develop or acquire a particular attribute. This raises the possibility that the color was either a natural adaptation or a deliberate effort. Adair's observations offer room for interpretation, inviting discussions on environmental adaptation versus theories like sexual selection. Though Adair's theories are diverse, they reflect the era's understanding of color variation. Stories circulated of children born with different colors due to external influences, like a black picture on a wall. Even historical records, such as the Philosophical Transactions, document instances of white children born to black parents. Adair's contention that external influences might lead to color variations within tribes suggests a dynamic interplay between genetics and environmental factors. In contemporary times, we understand that non-melanated parents cannot give birth to melanated children. However, the reverse is possible, with melanated parents able to produce children with various skin, hair, and eye colors seen across different races. This perspective aligns with the idea that the original complexion of humanity found in Africa is dark. This belief suggests that the indigenous people of North America were initially people of color, more precisely, copper or red clay colored, which, to some, might correspond to a type of brown often referred to as black by Europeans. In delving into Adair's work, one can be guided toward the idea that the natural color of North America's aboriginal indigenous people was a range of brown shades, including copper or red clay. These shades are often categorized as variations of brown, although historically referred to as black. This reflects the historical understanding of color and invites a nuanced exploration of the indigenous people's complex hues. Besides, their rights, customs, etc. As we shall presently see, prove them to be Orientalists, and, as the difference of color among the human species, is one of the principal causes of separation, strife, and bloodshed, would it not greatly reflect on the goodness and justice of the divine being, ignominiously to brand numerous tribes, and their posterity, with a color odious and hateful in the sight and opinion of those of a different color? James Adair's remaining observations about the North American Indians, encompassing their color, shape, temperament, and attire can be accessed on the Bang YouTube channel. These insights are part of the James Adair playlist named History of the North American Indians by James Adair Part 1, which offers an audio rendition of the initial chapter from his book. Having established this, I'd like to contribute my perspective to Adair's observations. I'd like to draw attention to two videos I've created that propose a plausible explanation for why the question of color holds significance in determining the true descendants of the North American Indians who thrived in the continent during the Pilgrim era. The first video outlines the three-point plan to hijack nations of Aboriginal natives, followed by the second installment, the Matrilineal Deception. Together, these videos introduce a theory regarding how the indigenous inhabitants of North America forfeited their lands by permitting intermarriage between white European men and various tribes. 
Over time, these marriages led to the transfer of land rights to their European-descended offspring, who could be characterized as part Aboriginal and part European. The unique matrilineal marriage system played a role in classifying these children as full-blood Indians, even though they were of mixed heritage. Subsequently, these purported full-blood individuals intermarried with European men and women. Within a span of fewer than a century, the native population lost their distinct copper color. This begs two questions. What happened to the original natives that contained this copper or red clay skin color? Now before I conclude, I'd like to mention that the content on this channel will maintain a personable style format. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to click the like button and share this video with those intrigued by this type of content. It's important to remember that you, the viewer, are the driving force behind this content. Please feel free to leave your comments as they greatly contribute to the ongoing discussion. Until next time, this band content will end in 3, 2, 1.